Today we're talking about successful Christian living. This is a multi-part series, but it will not be on next Sunday morning unless I, I get redirected. I am going to attempt to have another day sermon. The attempt. Whether that happens or transpires or not, it's up to God. I can't guarantee you that it will. We're going to give her a shot. Now, the word defines success in a term usually of accumulation of wealth or, or, or social status. You know, you're, you're something. I, I, I tell you what, you just, you, you just kind of have to shake your head sometimes. You, you know, there's a couple of times you've been out lately to eat. Uh, one place you're somewhere and they were. These women, you know, obviously they don't get out of that. And they just sat around talking about the wine they were drinking. They just like, they're like 50, 50, 60 year old women, just loud. You know, like drinking wine. They're having this kind of drink and that kind of thing. Just loud about it. I'm thinking, now this is the stuff that teenagers do when they're speaking behind mom and daddy's back and then bragging about it at school. You know, but you got adults out to speak it. But see, they go out because they can go out and drink. You know? You all hear this? Have a cognac. You know, all this kind of stuff. You know, she just said, like, that's just too. Yeah, but they've reached a societal stage where they're, you know, they're living like the, the upper echelon of society. You know, like, you know, well, the upper echelon of society drinks much time because they're, they're, they're dragging them down like out and out depressed. They're taking drugs, you know, to get over the depression. The kids are serving the devil. Hello, are you here? But they got they got status. You think success in life is, is is way more than your material accumulation or your societal status? Or you ask somebody to get we, we know Washington D.C. is just full of a bunch of people who want to have a status. You know, people who go work in in, in their in their um, you know, age to all these times, but they're just there for that. that I mean, most times for that societal status, they get to rub elbows with the big guys and all this kind of stuff. And, and you know what? That's not success. Amen? Amen? And, and that, that mindset infiltrates the church. If you've got a big church, you're successful. You can have a big church full of uh, numb souls who don't know anything about God who are defeated. Hello? Half of them aren't even saved. Sometimes preachers aren't even saved. Y'all hear? That's not a success because you've got a big church. You can draw a crowd. With the right amount of money, you can draw a crowd. That's not success. Are you all here? You're going home. So all those, all those, uh, in, in a natural mindset, let's, let's just kind of go back over here. Although in a natural mindset, to the world, in having, in having societal position or material wealth, it, to them is a legitimate arena of success. It's not necessarily the sign of biblical success. Amen? All right. Actually, they would be the lowest forms of any kind of success. Now, no, it is the last thing kind of flash. Yeah, because you know what? People can get money. Be, many people steal money. People sell drugs and get money. Hello? I mean, you ride down the road with your bling little bill. I remember the old song, you know, uh, Diamond in the Back, Gangster White Walls, Diamond in the Back, TV antenna, moving on the scene in the gangster machine. I remember that one. Seventy. You're my age. Are you older? How are you? No, you're not my age. You're old. Have mercy. I thought you. I thought you were close to my age. Amen. So I remember that, don't you? I mean, you know, people out hunting and all this kind of stuff got all kinds of money, bringing in with all the diamonds and the jewelry, and they're, and they're selling drugs to get it. That's not success. It is an accumulation of material wealth, but that doesn't mean you're successful. We've got to stop. We've got to reevaluate our terminology or our mindset for success. Amen. Now, as Christians, we are to succeed in every arena of life and not just in one. I understand that the prosperity message that really got out of balance in the church, and then people began to determine whether or not you were in faith or whatever, by how, by what kind of clothes you wore, what kind of car you wore, drugs, what kind of watch you had on, I mean, if you were blinking with the diamonds and the, and the gold necklaces, then you were a successful Christian. If you were driving a Bentley, you were successful. You can Bentley and have a, have, have a household that's full of people. Hello. 
You can have a jet and your wife run around with half the church. Come on now. It's not, we, we've got to get our eyes re, refocused and our mindset refocused. Amen? I mean, when, 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 when the writers of the, of the Word of God are telling all the things of the world, they come in but dumb for the gospel's sake. Then there's a mindset that we're missing today in the church. Hello? Okay. Christians to succeed in every area of life and not just one. Now, according to 1 Thessalonians 5 23, a man has a spirit, he has a soul, he has a body. I pray God your whole, your whole body. I mean, pray, I pray God of peace, sanctify you wholly, W H O L R Y. And I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus. So, Jesus defines success for the Christian in this. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciple. Fruit bearing discipleship is biblical success. That one ever thoroughly like a red balloon. I know, because about that, that 10, 15 years. You heard, you know, you know, money, having all this money, and, and people stuffing money in the preacher's coat while he's preaching and filling it up, and him walking out with bags of money, you know, and, and you're going to get rich overnight because you did that. And that's what we're preaching about success, success, success. And we're not, I'm going to tell you something, the Crepo had this right. He said, Money is neither good nor evil, but it is a magnifier. Now, what's in you will get magnified when you get money. Well, don't you think that if money is a magnifier, we need to stop preaching money as a sign of success and deal with the inner man so that when the money does come, it magnifies the fruit of the Spirit, and it magnifies character, and it magnifies integrity, and it magnifies uh, love, and it magnifies steadfastness. Amen? Instead of... Uh, Christians getting all this money and running off, and you can't find them in church. Oh, they're trying to run the church. I got some money, and I want you know, and, and I use my money to control whether or not you get, you do what you want to do, or you know, I want this done, so I'm gonna get. Here's my money, but I want it to go for this. Can I say something? I'm gonna stop right there. If God didn't call you to run in there and throw money in and then tell the leadership what to do with it, because it's in your heart for this to be done at the church. It should be that it's in the heart of the leadership to do this for the church, and you run and put your money in for what the leadership's doing. God's not going to tell you what needs to be done and then not tell the leadership. And then you're going to run in and tell them how to do it. Hello? Come on now. That's not godly. And you know, you keep saying, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't, I, the Lord told me to do something bold. Hello? I oh, would just say, both on the excrement. How about that? Are you here? That's not gospel. It's not right. God didn't call you to run the church with your money. Now, here's the thing. When, when people get money and they got, they got flawed in their inner in man, hello, they don't have the right kind of integrity. They're not, they're not servants. Hello, that begins to take over. we got to get rid of this thing. Now, people with money sit there and We put all the deacon boards of the, the business in these things. It's all right to have an advisory council of businessmen who, can, who have wisdom and financial matters, and you go in and say, here, what do you think about this? And they well, in my business, we do this. All right, you know, we, we've learned that through business models, we do this. That's, that's not, that's a, that's, a, that's a counseling or wisdom pool of resource. Are you here? You're going home. If you don't come in and start telling about how to do everything, here, here's my money. Now, I'm going to put in, but you got to do what I want you to do with it. God didn't tell you to do that. It's just like the guy, the guy I'm, I'm sorry. We have got to have a paradigm shift in our thinking as to what success is. Now, a number of years ago, when I first came to Greenville, we had a guy in our church. Anyway, here All right. Anyway, now, this guy, I mean, he, he, loved, he, he, he loved the Lord. But he knew too many voices. If he got a goose butt, God would lead him to do this. Or if he heard something say, do it this way. No, 
we were going to end up, we were build puzzles. And, we, and, and they, they, you know, I said, it's a puzzle puzzle. He's like, oh, wait, he can build this puzzle. Very nice puzzle. And, and uh, you know, and, and uh, here's what we did. And we bought the wood and all this kind of stuff. And it was going to be a, you know, a, kind of a tradition party. They had the center thing with the plants and the side, you know, and the shells. And, the, and on the front, we were going to put a, a cross on the front. And, and I said, now, here's what I want. Like a special walnut stone with a satin finish. Now, see, I saw the podium before it stained it. And it, it was looking great. I already put that stain on, like I said, it was perfection. So, put on Sunday morning, all the trim is done in a, in a darker stain. All the other wood is done, it, it, there's no stain. And how glass to up. And I walked up to him. Did you see me this way? No, he didn't. But you know, what do you do? I mean, you know, it's, it's done. I mean, you know, you know and, 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 and you're just moving into the church at that time, and, you know, you're, you're, you're the young guy, and these guys. They were did not tell him this thing and do it completely. I, I mean, how glass to up. I mean, if the lights hit you couldn't see, you couldn't see your notes. I mean, it was, atro- it was actually atrocious looking. It was wrong. It just looked wrong. It just didn't look right. Had it done it exactly the way I said it, it would have been beautiful. This is what I want. Yeah, I'm the pastor. I'm the leadership. God didn't tell you to do exactly opposite of what the leadership said. Well, you're going to put your money out the door. All right. I get so tired of it. The church is not walking in some of these places we're going to talk about for success. Or you've you got money and you've got fancy clothes, you've got nice house, you've got cars, and you think you're somebody. That's not success. Hello? Because you're leaving a wake of destruction everywhere you go. With your money back. That's not success. Amen. Now, you business people, you, I'm preaching right at you this morning. Keep the right heart. Keep the right attitude. Let what God is blessed, uh, what let the success and the natural that you're experiencing be a blessing instead of a millstone and a curse everywhere you go. So the stuff that you get away with because you got money, you would never get away with if you didn't. And that's the truth. If you didn't have the money, you wouldn't get away with it. Because you wouldn't have any friends. Nobody can hang out with you. And you wouldn't have anywhere to go to hide because you don't have any money to go hide anywhere. You wouldn't get away with it. Think about this. Have any of you ever seen that uh, movie, The Devil Wears Prada? You know, with Glenn Close and, and, Jean, and, and Anne Hathaway in it? And the, and the black woman is, I mean, she is a demon. I mean, she just, that's why I call the devil with her father. That woman is the devil. The devil is not a woman. I'm telling you. And she just uses her, her position to bully and to run people around like the king of Manasseh has a lead of almost success that, the, that the people are afraid to deal with. But see, in the church, we can't bring that into the church. But we do. We just do that right into the church. And we, we preach messages on Christ. We, we fill up a building on Christ every single day. How does everybody get debt free? Because everybody wants to be debt free. I'm going to tell you something. If you learn to do and to produce the things of successful Christian living in these other dreams, you'll have success. And the money will come. Because you'll do the right thing. You'll, you'll give and you'll come. And when the magnifier comes into your life, it won't be magnifying itself sin again. And arrogance and pride. They do, they do magnifying submission. They do magnifying integrity. They do magnifying love. They do magnifying. Uh, uh, did I say submission already? All right. So, so Jesus told his disciples, I, I didn't know that I was going to go out and talk about anything, but I'm going to say that thing's gotten into the church. And we people are just scrambling to have all the money. I remember this guy around here, up in West Virginia or whatever, you know, that won the lottery. He used to walk around with half a million dollars in a suitcase and go down. Now, before that, 
he was he was a Christian. Now he's not a Christian. He, he, he went to church, and when he first went, he said, "I'm going to die." Well, then he's got grandkids killing, uh, killing a boyfriend or some crazy man. He's out going to clubs all the time, gambling like crazy. Hello, and so then he got he got he got broke. He got broke. And he won like thirty, forty, mil, or fifty million dollars, some crazy number. Okay, and then he passed at the end of that. Eighty-eight hundred thousand, eighty-eight hundred thousand, hundred million dollars. That's the taxes that they each have. It takes a long time. You just miserable. Why? Because he wasn't. He didn't have the rock and shovel before that money came in. This is you know, this is why a lot of us are bad. These people who went, people who are living paycheck to paycheck and living living defeated all the time, and they win eighty million dollars. All they do is they raise their defeated livestock and back to eighty million dollars and blow that money. Take these kids and everything, and then they, they get this NBA contract, and they get $15 million a year. And they, and this, is now, this is changing a little bit because some, somebody finally realized that we start doing some mentoring to these kids. Michael Jordan is one of the guys. Start mentoring the kids because the, the average NBA basketball player retired broke. How can you make $15 million a year and retire broke? You got an agent who's loves stuff and you can do any, anything you want, but he can remain your agent. Well, he's living off of your money. And so he's letting you drive your bring good deal. And he's letting you have your big house and big party. And that's all working fine until the money drives up. And then you ain't got nothing. And he said, the NBA retirement thing is not $15 million a year. Nor is the NFL, nor is the MLB, or anybody else. All right. Paradigm shift. Jesus said, here is my Father glorified. Now, we sometimes got to deal with what's going on in the world because it's affecting the church. Amen? That you bear much fruit. And nowhere in the fruit of the Spirit is money listed. Are y'all here? Jesus told his disciples they would glorify God or achieve a favorable or satisfactory outcome if they would bear much fruit. The Word gives us this insight on this throughout the New Testament that the believer is a fruit bearer. The more fruit, the more success. We are to strive to meet the desires of the Father, and His definition of success is we're to be truly successful Christians. Now, here's an interesting scripture. As much emphasis as we put on having money and having super, I mean, supernatural death cancellation, abundance of wealth, the scripture says it is certain we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out. Therefore, lay up your store of your treasures in heaven. When moth does not enter in, nor rust does corrupt. That one ever be. Now listen, I'm not preaching against God wanting us to prosper. I'm trying to bring us into a perspective we have to understand that the gospel is not about you having a big a house at, 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 at Oak Island, and a house up in uh, Blowing Rock, and a house here, and a cruise boat in the Caribbean, and you just fill up the church once uh, every other uh, decade. Because you've been riding around the world on that wealth you've got. So we bobble heads this morning. All right? As pastor preached tonight, you know it. We have to understand that we are to be engaged in fruit development in our lives. The development of fruit in our lives. Hallelujah. Um. Now, see, God wants to be successful. Um, John, third John 2 says this, Beloved, I wish or pray above all things you may prosper and be in health. That's what he says there. See, God's not against the prosperity. But listen to where he, he listens to the correlation and he's about to make between that, your, your financial prosperity, your physical prosperity, and even as thy soul prosper. Notice that the correlation that, that, that we lead out so many times in the church it is not about getting money so you can you can you know have your power high this week. You can drive your fancy car. There are people when they when they hear about supernatural death cancellation, you know I'm talking like, and you don't have to say amen, amen, oh me, or help me, Jesus. You don't say anything. But there are people when somebody comes and says, I got a thousand fold anointing tonight, you give this offer, you're gonna get a thousand fold return in Jesus' name. They're already buying the Cadillac. In their mind. 
they, they thought did not go. Finances are coming if we don't support the gospel. Why? Because we use the, the materialistic things of life as the first. We preach about how things like our dog is. Well, I do care how it's going to be right here. You don't cover the church, you don't take all the money from the people in the church because they're going to give up and bless you, and you got $15,000 on it, and you're going to use you're using your lifestyle as a hook to get people to give. Instead of teaching people that we, as we give and God bless us, we can get the kingdom built, we can reach the law. We, you know, well, I heard that Hagen say this one time. He said, you know, he used to, you know, and I've heard people say the same teaching. When he was talking about that he believed that he received, you know, you know, a thousand dollar gift, one time thousand dollar gift, and then he got to where he was getting fifty thousand, then he got to a million dollars. And he said in the sixth sermon when he had taught this, uh, now I've heard people take that same teaching about I believe that I received one time gift of that similar, and it's offered them personally. They will believe it's them personally. So now I could say some time for them personally. But I heard Dad say this. He said, so people miss stuff all the time. He said, we're going to know all that money. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put it right back into the work of the ministry. We're going to put more books. We're going to make more tapes. We're going to reach more people with the gospel. We're going to get on more radio stations. We're going to get the word out there. See, his heart for the prosperity was to reach the people. So as the money came in, it magnified what was in his heart. Reach more people. The ability. Then you hear people taking that same principle, and they're talking about, you know, I'm going to have more money. I'm going to have this, and I'm going to have that. And, 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 and you don't hear... People. That's the condition of the church. I'm going to tell you why some people, why a lot of people are not prosperous, although they've given to every preacher that told them they did. Because their heart was not to build the church. Their heart was not to increase the ability of the church to do its job. It was about them. That's what people make all kinds of land there for they get money to spend on something, something for the big and tens of thousands of dollars. And they could they could they could finance the gospel. No, I want this. Yeah, that's fine if you want it. Why don't you finance the gospel? Let God bless you with it. Hello. I know I'm hitting hard, hard, hard. But we're gonna we've got to have some stakes and some teaching shit. Can I be honest with you? I like nice clothes or whatever, but I don't know if you have to have five thousand dollars on one table of seats. I don't I have a hard time. No, especially knowing me. Because first time I went out of the year, so I went through the doorway, I'm running the doorway. I, I, I think I'm smaller than I am. I'll do, I run into the door jam. I mean, I've been in my house for 13 years, and I still run into the door jam sometimes. I don't know what it is. Don't you say anything, Nathan. I'll run into you. Sit on you. Hallelujah. I don't even have to do anything yet. Just sit on you. <laughs> Amen. All right. But John said, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may trust from being held. And people say, Oh, yeah, God wants us to trust from being held. But it left out the even so. Or even less. Even less. God so prosper. So what does that tell me? that the financial prosperity and the physical prosperity is contingent upon first having soul prosperity. Or in other words, working out things in your life that God wants to work out in your life that deals with your character and deals with your integrity and deals with all those things. God wants that established first. God wants that established. If you just got saved last week and you come in and you say, Oh, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to have a million dollars. And you get it. And you haven't developed integrity. You haven't developed character. That money will magnify all the things in your life that haven't taken care of yet. It's just like, you know, drug addicts. Now, when you're, when you're, when you're, uh, or, uh, just take alcohol. Now, when you're poor, and don't have money, and you scratch and get just enough money, so you can run, run by some Mad Dog 2020. Or some Richard Wild Irish Road wine. And you can run with some money, you might go get you, you know, some 
you know, Chardonnay or some, you know, Bonpreon or some of those fancy alcohol, but you're still doing the same thing with it. All you did was that, that you got the money to elevate what was in you anyway to a higher status. Now, I have, I, I mean, I used to, I used to have a little uh, alcohol stuff around East of Carolina and going into the convenience store. You find a mad dog going to one of the over in the, in the cheap convenience store somewhere. You don't find that at the grocery store on the, on the, the fancy wine. Now, you find that stuff where people just kind of put it down for a cheap drink. You can have those trucks with those Richard Wild Irish Rose pictures on the side of them. Somebody's actually making money selling that nasty stuff. I mean, it was just one step from money selling. That's all it was. It was legalized money selling. Y'all hear you going home. But what happened? People get some money, they may never buy that, but they're going to go buy some other alcohol and drink it and get the same thing in their life the depression, a substance abuse, and so forth. People who, who don't have a lot of money buy cheap drugs. If they get more money, they'll buy designer drugs. And they'll, they'll go do it in a fancy club where it's uptown and it's cool instead of in the back room of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an abandoned, condemned house with a bunch of other crap here. Hello. When we learn, I'm, this is a long introduction, but I'm telling you, because of the emphasis on money and it's entered into the church, and because of the constraints that people with money put on the church, because they, because they let money control them instead of them allowing the word to control them, we've got to deal with this so we can move on. We're going to have to break down this mindset and move into a biblical mindset and start first with soul prosperity. Amen? Developing fruit. Here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Hallelujah. All right. So, let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, now the word Spirit there, if you've got a King James Bible, and probably a lot of other translations, is capitalized. But in the Greek, there, there would be the capital, there was a single case. There was an upper or lower case. Um, and so you have here, this is the word pneuma. And I, I, I present to you this, this, this for thought. The fruit of the Spirit is, the Holy Spirit doesn't bear fruit. You do. Your spirit bears fruit. And so contextually here, it makes more sense to recognize that the, the fruit of the recreated human spirit, the fruit of the recreated human spirit in this case. The Holy Spirit's not a fruit bearer. He's God. Okay? You are the bearer of fruit. Now you can say you're bearing His fruit, and now you can go around this a little bit. But I want you, I'm, I'm trying to make a point here that your spirit has to bear fruit. You have to produce fruit. You grow fruit in your life. Amen? Okay? So, um, and you can, I mean, you can go either way with it, but really, I, I believe contextually, it makes more sense to say the fruit of the recreated human spirit and not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Okay? If you're not trying to get His fruit off of Him into you, you're trying to uh, grow what your spirit is designed to grow. You're the one who needs love. He is love. He says love in your heart, you know, the love of God is shed in your heart by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. You're the growers. You're the cultivators. Now, understand these things come from God. I get that. But your spirit is the one to grow it. Your spirit is the one that's going to produce it. Amen. See, you see, if it was just the Holy Spirit, you'd get baptized. You're born again and baptized in the Holy Ghost, and you'll automatically start having love, joy, peace, gentleness, and all of people. You find out a lot of people have any of them. Not produce. Hello. They got meanness. And anger, got a third paper, hard as a rock, and got no faith. Are you here? And no temperance. I mean, when you look at their lives, they're born again, so the Holy Ghost speaking to them, they got none of that working. Because they're babies, they need to grow, they need to mature it, they need to cultivate it. Amen? All right. So the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Really faithfulness, really, is what that word is. Meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. The word translated faith is better translated faithfulness. Why? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faithfulness is a, is a character. If you look at the, the, these fruits of the Spirit, they are character issues. Walking in love is a character issue. Do you have the love of God functioning and operating in your life or not? 
Okay? Now, this analyzes, this first of all, look at love, a God faith, a God kind of love. God is with love and the love that the human spirit is to cultivate. It is the love that was set upon our hearts by the Holy Ghost in Romans 5 5. Um, this love is the love of the human spirit is to cultivate. It is the love set upon our hearts by the Holy Ghost. This, there can be no successful Christian life without love. You sit down. You say, say, la. You cannot live a successful Christian life outside the realm of love. And I didn't say be stupid, but I said love. We have to let the love of God function in our lives. Can you say amen? Don't mind if I sit for just a minute. Um, Galatians 5, 6 says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision of any thing, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Energized, empowered. Faith works. is energized by, empowered by love. So if you're not walking in love, your faith won't work. If your faith won't work, you can't please God. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Amen. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, back up. Why don't y'all stand up for me? Let's do a Jesus Day thing. I'm going to sit, you're going to stand. All right, now. I like this. Y'all just stand here. We're going to take chairs out next week, and I'm just going to have a chair. I'm going to sit down. Y'all just get back down. I'm just messing with you. Paul asked the question, and this is each King James translation. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sound and brass, a clanging symbol. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, but I can remove mountains, but I have not love, I have nothing. Now look, we got a lot of people because somebody can prophesy, because somebody um, has different gifts operating in them. Uh, because they're speaking in tongues and interpreting or whatever, we automatically want to listen to them. But I'm going to tell you something. One thing you need to check up on is a love walk. Hello. Because Paul says, if you do all those things, have not love, you're nothing. That's what he says. Isn't that what he says? Then I sell my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, I have not love. The prophets mean nothing. That's a heavy ready. Now listen, this is going to, I, I, I know people right now, the first sentence is going to knock them out of the game. Love suffers long in its time. Oh! <laughs> I mean, I just tied them right on up, didn't it? Listen, folks, you got to suffer long to be kind. I didn't say you suffer your whole life, but you got to be long suffering or suffer long. You've got you to have the ability to put up with some stuff. Have some thick skin and be kind in the midst of it. Now, I studied the other day at school, and uh, they'll let me free time, and I have to kind of monitor the free time. Things can get out of hand and hurt me. But the nice great boys still play, play from five, uh, eight on eight, you know, and then traveling and, and then fouling and hacking. And one of these kids, not one of the smaller kids down. He wasn't malicious. He didn't run up to him and just like, you know, take a beeline at him and take it down, take him out. But they were, they were playing pretty, they played him pretty aggressive. Not so much. And that kid started kicking. Kick, I mean, he, the guy was kind of tagging up with him. He was kicking his legs and playing. And, he, and I, I, mean, I had to stop it in a hurry. Like, number one, you hit his kneecap just like the amount of pressure you're putting on. It's going to take about 70 pounds per square inch of pressure. You can crush the kneecap. Because I, I had to get him pretty strong. You know, he came back and apologized and said, you know, just, you have to control, I mean, you have to control your voice. Now, I don't think he did it maliciously, but even if he did, your response can't be without what this was. Now, in the church, we get stuff going on. Did you know somebody in this church is going to make you mad or piss you off or hurt your feelings eventually? I think I do it every week. I just, I, I piss people off. I'll say something to just get them to get up off because I'll take people to the one who's on the what I said. Some pastors don't want really to say anything about politics. I don't want to recast the church. Yeah. But I'll say this, you know, we need to vote biblically. 
it's, it's hard to vote for people. And I'm, I'll be honest with you, I have a hard time voting for people who, who believe in gay marriage and abortion. I, just, I, I can't do it. I cannot do it in this time to vote for somebody who openly professes they think gay marriage is okay and killing babies is okay. I can't vote for them. I don't care who they are. I don't care what party they're part of. I don't care, you know, how good it makes me feel. I can't vote for them. I don't care if they were my best friend. I can't vote for them. I have, a, I have an obligation as a Christian to do to, 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 to what's righteous in our nation. Anyway, that makes people mad when I say stuff like that. They get upset with me. Well, love you. Hello? You want to hear me go home? You're going to have to suffer some stuff walking in love. Now, I've heard people say, well, God told me I didn't have to be the devil's doormat. You don't have to be the devil's doormat, but you still better be laying down your life for the rest. Greater love has no man in this city who lays down his life for the devil. There's going to be some things you're going to have to do that's going to be suffering in this world. The same amount of vote that we expect them to give up. Hello. I've had people say, Well, you still know my heart. Okay. Well, you're you're fearing for this person, you should have known their heart. You should have you should have understood where I was at. You should have understood where they were. Hello? You know, I get all kinds of stuff coming in my office. You know? And, they, and, and, I, and, and when I have to correct them, I do it with stuff. They say, well, you just should have known my heart. Well, why are you giving that same, that same demand? Why doesn't it govern your life when you know another person or give that person, give them the same leeway of knowing their heart that you expect everybody to give you? You can walk in love. Love. love is kind. And then love suffers long in its pain. If you're going to expect everybody to do that for you, you might be doing it for everybody else. Isn't that right? You know, stuff goes through this church and people get mad and leave and get mad because of this, get mad because somebody did this or somebody said that or somebody, you know, aggravated them or somebody did this or something. People just leave and go off to somewhere else. And then it's because they're not doing this. They're not suffering long and they're not being pain. It's about them. Can I say something to you this morning? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. And your life is now hidden in Christ. So, it ain't got nothing to do with you. It has to do with representing Jesus Christ and how He is. As a lamb before her shearer, he opened not his mouth. Get your nerf guns out and shoot me now. Get it out of your system. Y'all done? Okay. Are you here? We're make, people are making decisions about their relationship to other Christians and their churches because they're not walking in love. I can tell you, people, when you come to me and say the Lord showed you this and you're not walking in love, I don't believe a word of it. You can go tell around the world that God told you and God spoke and God said, I don't believe a word of it. Because your flesh, is, you, wouldn't know, you wouldn't know the voice of the Holy Ghost in that state if you walked in with white bell bottoms, platform shoes, with a pink shirt and a Kelly green coat. Hello? And a red feather in your white batter hat. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't recognize it. Why? Because when you're not walking in love, you're shutting down and you're back in your path to what here from heaven. And people are going to make grand, grandiose decisions. And I'm not talking about just one individual in our church. I'm talking about people over the years who have experienced it. And he thinks, I know about other churches. People do this all the time because they're not walking in love. They're not, being, they're not suffering while they're not being kind. Hello. Love is not envy. People get upset because somebody got something they didn't get. They get envious. 
Why does that parade itself? It's not puffed up. Now, it does not parade itself. We got some strutters in the kingdom of God. They're arrogant and full of themselves. Hello? They're too good to serve. They got to be in charge. Hello? I'm going to tell you something. If you can't clean the toilet, you can't get up the usher. I'm just telling you. I've done my duty. I mean, how many things Jesus would pay me to do that time he was in the ministry? Now, he got out one day and washed the disciples' feet. I think he paid me to do that. He wasn't too busy. He wasn't beyond being one of the lowest menial hands of anything else to wash somebody's nasty, stinking, dirty feet. Get out stepping the camel, doo-doo, walking, all kinds of junk and junk on the ground, and, and, and you washing their feet. The master, the head of the church, is washing their feet. Hello? Are y'all here and you don't have it? It's not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not. We've got some rude Christians. Not necessarily this church, but we we can come along with the folks just like you're rude. But I just can't be rude one to another. So I don't like them. That's a problem. Hello? Deal with yourself. Are you here? You've gone home. You can't have that being obnoxious and rude to everybody in the church just because, you know. You don't like them, and you don't like the way they do this, or they said something you, one way you didn't like one time, and you cut them off. That's not the spirit of God. That's not the love of God. Hello? Listen, Jesus is talking with the disciples and the apostles and those who were the same apostles. I was just telling you, and you didn't go eat with Papa Chicken and Sanders. You've got, you got to say that. That wasn't the, the pastor's bus he was hanging out with in there. He was going to carry his love to him. He's going to share his love with us. He's going to demonstrate his love to us. And we've got Christians who can't come to church one with another and be loving and kind. They're rude to us. What is it with this? Hello? Well, what's rude? I'll tell you what rude is. You can come to church and you stand in the floor and talk about your favorite buddy or buddy is. And three people that, that, that are marginal in the church walk by and say, hey, to you, hey, and you keep on talking. Because you're engaged in your conversation. It's about your conversation. It's about you having your time with your buddy. Make some time at a restaurant this week. And make sure you reach out to people who are fringe people. Make sure you reach out to people who may not engage you in conversation. Find a way to communicate with them. Even though they're uncommunicatable. Now, there's some folks that come out with it's like knocking them out and dragging it out of them. Well, then do it. Well, maybe not knock them out, but. Or just force this stuff upon them to engage in conversation. Don't be rude to them. Or if they walk by, they walk right by you, and then you're standing right there, and instead of stopping, they just say, it's so good to see. I mean, we, we, we love you. You're a real blessing. You know? Why not? Why, why not take the time and get out of your little world? You can call me on Monday on her cell phone. Amen. If she's not in class, or writing a paper, or doing a project. Amen. Oh, come to church. At, now, Sunday night at church, she'll hang around and talk to you. Sure will. She'll stay here for an hour and a half talk to you. Hey, listen, she heard it. She's getting something. She heard it. They're getting talk sometimes. Just go and go and go. At the end of the hour of the moon, they just go on and go on and go. I don't even call. I don't know what it means. I just haven't done preach. I'm ready to go home. Hallelujah. They, you know, I do not drive off and leave my wife. 
rude. What am I saying? Love's not rude. Let's not be rude. Well, here comes one. Does not seek its own. It is not all about me. Are you here? Is not provoked, thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices with truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Now, I read the Amplified Bible, which says, believes all things. The Amplified says, he's ever ready to believe the best of everything. That's smart. I mean, if there is a balance to believe in the best, but I mean, if they're out, if they're out shooting guns, going, well, I don't believe they'd be shooting up. They're sitting, they're sitting there high as a kite, they are shooting up. Now, you want to believe the best, but if they're not doing it, you've you got to deal with that, but you know, you deal with it in love. Amen. Isn't that right? But it endures, it hopes, bears, some folks, folks, we've got to learn to bear one another. We've got to learn that, that when, when someone offends us, that we deal with that offense and get rid of it and bear up under whatever it is we, our, our personal, and I'm going to tell you something. A lot of stuff that people don't bear up with is because of their own personal pride and arrogance. Don't nobody, don't nobody treat me that way and get away with it. You have people in the church that did one thing and it's forever that they didn't know. And if they, if it's all, if they repent, I'll, I, I'll forgive them. Have kind of that mindset in our church. That if Greg offends Dick and Dick is hurt by what Greg did, that Dick can forgive him and go forward. Even in recognition that Greg hasn't realized he did wrong. Because eventually, about five years ago, I got a phone call. Now, we had a good number of years ago. We had a, 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 I mean, some, some, some so called pastor. And he called somewhere where he went. And, and, and then he ended up, you know, having it out with, when I say having it out, I'm talking about, you know, uh, uh, get it on. I mean, with somebody in the church. Your church, because he's he's taking off his to the IRS church. A few years later, he got caught in the office with something in with, with uh, his worship leader. And they were singing, but they won't sing it unto the Lord. Now, well, y'all get you get where I'm at right now. Well, one of the couples that got caught up in all that. Now, about five years, this guy called me. He said, "He said, Pastor, he said, so what are you doing?" He said, "I, I just called you." He said, "You know." Uh, me and my wife, we were divorced, we're no longer together. Uh, he said, but I called to repeat for what the trouble I called you and what I did back in that day. He said, I was wrong. I just got called up in it. And it's been ten, over 10 years. And it took him 10 years for him to, to come to the place that God was able to say, you did as Ed had done and faith and witness was wrong and how you conducted yourself during that time, and he was at a bro- place of, of brokenness in his marriage and his life that God could deal with it. I don't think God broke it. I think if you live a certain way, you'll get broken. It's going to happen. Now, you can either humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and humble yourself, or you can go through life doing it your own way and you won't get broken. Now, what you do with it is, is up to you. And he repented. And I said, Brother, I forgave you a long time ago. But for your sake now, I forgive you. Amen. My wife reminded me of it. Of, of another minister that we were on staff together in church, and uh, 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 maybe about the same, same name, maybe you're you on either side of this particular event. And he, and he did some stuff that it wasn't, wasn't quite right in his relationship towards us at that, that, that church. He called us in. You know, if you'll just get out of the way and let God deal with his people, and you walk in love for them, and even though they may not recognize it at the time, if you give, if, if you give it enough time and in, in, in a lot of cases, I'll get to it. I'll call you back in the kingdom. Maybe you've got to walk in there. Amen. 
Now, some people got track record. They don't. They, they just get. They, they leave a wake everywhere they go. Well, you know, you just keep trusting. That eventually, God's gonna get a hold of them. You know, you just maybe you know, maybe God will get them this time. <laughs> if you want Him to, you want to stand straight to God. You want to get straight to God. Amen. We got to walk in here. We can't be running half the church off because of, because our pride got hurt. We can't be bringing destruction in the midst of the congregation because we're upset about what somebody did to us across the aisle. And we come to church, and there's so much tension. You can't, I mean, you, you could you take a chainsaw to break it and have a big fight. Hello? You can't have that in the church. That's the wrong spirit. Amen? And the solution's not going somewhere else. The name, what did you just say what I think you said? <laughs> I think it's because I think based on the police not going so much because you take you with you or something like that. But you do that, that's right. All right. Love never fails. So whether it be prophecies, they will fail, whether it's stones, they will cease, whether it's knowledge, they will vanish away. This passage of scripture gives us a guideline to which we can measure our love walk. We can measure your love walk by the strength of church and one foot down. Amen. Are you here? If we're acting in line with this passage, then our love walk, if we're not acting, that's right, if we're not acting in line with this passage, our love walk is not successful. We won't be successful. And if we're not successful, we need to cultivate this since it is the first fruit listed in the fruit of the Spirit, walking in love. Now, we could spend, we could spend a month on walking in love. Let me say this. If you just read 1 Corinthians 13, 1, uh, 13 verses 1 through 8, and you're going to cultivate those things in your life, and you'll get a chance right here. Amen. Y'all remember, y'all remember my story that I first said today to, to watch my anime. You ever heard my story? That pastor I was talking about earlier, um, he tore our church up. He just tore it up. Gathered everybody together, called everybody up there. Oh, we're gathering up all the, the scattered sheep that Ed Taylor scattered all the things. Well, our new pastor is a pastor of Jeremiah. Sent by God to gather up all the scattered sheep. And they were having this, so they were the scattered. They didn't call them this, but I, I kind of nicknamed them this. They were the scattered sheep of Ed Taylor Church. Because that's what they were called. That's what they were saying. That this guy had a true pastor's heart. True pastors don't get it on with congregational members. Actually, don't get it on with anybody but your wife. I know I'm talking a little crude here. I know it's a little crude, but let's, let's just get down where people live. Are you here? I mean, look. Uh, Listen, listen, folks. If you're a true, if you're if you're a truly Christian, you're not a Christian. You ain't running around getting it on with somebody you ain't married to. Hello. And if you're a true pastor, but especially if you're a true pastor, you ain't taking advantage of your position of authority. You can get you get you some honey on the side. This man got so bad. His wife was a diabetic. She was on. She got to the point she was on a diabetic insulin pack that that would on a timer that would inject her with insulin. It's not it's not she was so bad. She'd go into almost diabetic coma, beg him to call 911. He just looked at her and said, Use your faith. Because he had a sugar baby living in the basement. Because he was counseling her. The wisdom of this world is earthly, sensual, and devilish. She was getting some earthly, sensual, and devilish counsel. She ain't not joking. She was riding around in the car, and, and, and the, the wife was in the back seat, and the worship leader was in the front seat. Get up in the pulpit on Sunday morning and tell the congregation, you know, look, if you see us together, if you come out to church and we're here together late at night or whatever, you know, we have a special anointing together and we're working on things for the ministry. Now, somebody's trying to figure that out and started going and spying and checking it out and calling driving this at 2 o'clock in the morning. Flash the light. They come in and they get in that car and in the office of the door lock. 2 o'clock in the morning. You can hear me saying that you get it all in. All right, I'm just messing up. Hallelujah. <laughs> 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 he does it way really better than I do. Hallelujah. Now, that guy just tore our church up. Let me just tell you, I'd go to a Brother Hagin meeting or something, and he always show up. And he'd come running over to me, saying, I love you, brother. He said, I want to knock the teeth out. I'm just being real honest. I'm just being real honest. We almost went bankrupt. We almost went under. My, I mean, and what really irritated me was I started talking about my wife. 
babies in the church to come to Jamie and say, we want to be a blessing. Come over and help you clean the house. And, you know, you got this small baby. We want to help you to take care of stuff around the house. They come over and mop and clean and clean the house. You know, when they got up to the new church, little girl, he sat down and watched that clean that house. Yeah. And come back and we will be a blessing. And then after you're a blessing, you're going to go out to the house. He sat down and watched you clean that house. But that's what you asked to do. Yeah? You said you wouldn't come be a blessing. Then after you were a blessing, you were a curse. Well, anyway, I mean, the finances dried up and we were struggling things with him. And, he, and then he, he showed up at the camp meeting. Coming up, he said, I love you, brother. We got a meeting. He, he sent us check. He sent us blood money. I want to bless you for $50. I don't want your $50. Give me that. some money. What you buying on your way out of what you did? Get a camp meeting, dad starts teaching and walking in love. I guess, oh, man. I don't know why I can't put it away. She just ran and got me and said, what are you going to do with that one? And then he said something else. He said, when? What are you going to do with that? And then I have him, she take her hand, she take her hand, put her top of her hand, and take this long thing in there, she said, and then just start sticking me. She goes, what are you going to do with that? He's sitting there, and I'm stewing because he's in the other part of the building with his wife and that woman. And I said, we didn't know what was going on that time. Find that out later. Meeting's over. Walked out of the center center. Got about two blocks back up to the Williams Center. To, to, to the Gulf, not to the Adams Mark. And I go back in 105 degree weather by where I was going. What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do? You know what, you know what I want to say? You know what I wanted to say? Now, I know better than until a five foot two inch chair seat shut up. But I wanted to say, woman, shut up. Just shut up. Get back to the room, turn the air conditioner, lay down across the bed, because it's hot as everything out there. It's hot. You know? And lay down, you know what she does? What's she going to do when he preached this morning? I'm telling you, she was, she was like a bulldog in a bone. I mean, she wasn't going to let it go. And finally, I said, it's a good time to have to now, what I didn't say, on the end of that, what I said, you can't stop. You can't stop. You can't stop. So I got to, 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 but I had to make a decision. I said, Lord, I forgive him. I said, I'll put it in your hands. You deal with him. You deal with his heart. But I forgive him for everything he's done. And he says, I've seen a bunch of people. He always wanted to meet me. Some of you are, are hating on me. Or coconut. That was nice service. I didn't even get a chance to kind of work it out for a couple of services. Walk up to the cemetery at the night, there's talking to a friend of mine, and somebody comes up behind me and grabs one and goes, I'm going to ask him. Now, every time before that, over that past year or so, and when, he, when I saw him, he attended it, I turned around and I could feel the, 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 the I could feel. I don't feel much in there, I feel right up in I could feel my face go flush. I could feel my feet, my fist was dripping. I didn't want to come in there and get me. Well, yeah, but I got flesh too. I wanted to pop him on so bad, and for the first time, I didn't. I would say, I love you too. And, and, I, and, and I didn't, I wouldn't say it, just and he, and it was gone. He said, when you walk in, it makes a big difference. And about a year later, he got caught. I'm convinced, had I not let go of my anger, God couldn't have dealt with the situation. He needed to be dealt with. But I had that moment. Somebody hurt me and done me wrong. And yet, I wanted my vengeance. I wanted my. I saw me Ahab. I wanted my cow in the flesh. I wanted my Moby Dick. Are you here? The problem is, when you want Moby Dick, is you get hurt. That's what that story is all about. Your desire for reparation. Because I got them love. Amen? All right. That's the first step.
Thanks for Christian living, walking in love.